My name is Myron Dewey, Digital Smoke Signals. How's everyone doing today? I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge the indigenous people of this land first. And who's, who's from here? Okay, does, okay, now at a show of hands, leave your hands up. Okay, don't, don't say nothing, there's some people who live here. Live here or we're born here? If, if we're born here, live here, whichever one, visit. All right, so put your hands down if you know the tribe that is here first, the First Nation people. And if you don't, leave your hand up. Okay, so we got one person that don't know the indigenous First Peoples here. So do we have somebody that lives here that can share with them what are the First people, the indigenous people right here? What's their traditional name? And they, any of you guys know any of the language? So for us, I want to share with you guys uh, our protocol to go to another indigenous community is to ask for permission that we're coming, so we're not coming in war. Okay? As you guys may have known at first contact, that probably was not done, right? So we have an opportunity to make history a wrong right by today. So I'm going to share with you guys an example on how to do that. Because I just want to honor our relatives here. We say thank you for letting us bring this film here. And to share with you, we come in a good way. And, and good intentions. And what we're about to see is going to be hard on a lot of us. And that I'm going to ask our relatives here to help us with that prayer after we, we see what we see. And that we can heal together as native and non-native relatives sharing the same space on Mother Earth in the same water. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our relatives. And I want to thank you guys for allowing me to share this with you guys and to bring it to the community that you guys share with, the beautiful land of the first people. And for me, witnessing this, first people that, the first indigenous people at the first wave of contact is really humbling for me to see how strong their spirit and traditions and family are still here holding it. And I'm gonna take that home with me and share with my people, my relatives, my family, the strength. And I wanna say thank you, thanks. Hey, you're gonna. You need a mic. You want to say a few words at a time. Uh, we'd just like to share a, a song to, to get started. This this is a, this is our song. This is uh, we call it the anthem. But this the, the words are, uh, we're from Aquina. We we're still here. This is is, is what the, the words mean. And, uh, <coughs> that, uh, and we're, we're we are Blackbrook singers. Um, we're the community drum for the uh, Aquina Wampanoag tribe. <coughs> Um, I'm, I'm Morty Vanderhoof, this is my brother David, my cousin Tobias, my other brother Chip here. Uh, uh, if, if, if you could uh, all stand up, this, you know, this is uh, for uh, all of our ancestors and, and uh, those who have shown before us. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that the protocol too is being that this song is, is it ceremonial or do you want people to film? Or no? It's okay. Okay. Thank you.
you. We're gathering with two of the directors who are here, and uh, and as well as another guest on the panel, um, Myron Dewey, yeah. <laughs> James Bion, and Tanyette Cologne, who is here as an ally and was also at Standing Rock and, and to talk about ways that we can be water protectors and allies. Is there anyone in the room that would like to be a water protector, an earth protector, an ally? Show of hands, yay, yes, all right. <laughs> We're gonna talk, I think the film is so inspiring. I'm Allison Rose Levy, I'm an environmental journalist and radio host, and so we're gonna talk about some of the inspiration behind this and what these terrific people have to teach us about um, where our heart can be and what we can do. So we'll start with you, Myron. Um, how are you role modeling for people? how to walk in the pathway that we've seen the courageous people at Standing Rock walking, and how can we help, and what do we need to know in order to, to do that? Well, thank you. And the, and the theater for uh, showing the film. I think one way, an example, is how we've seen the opening happen, is when you go anywhere in this country, you're walking on indigenous land and to be reminded that for us, it's walking, uh, walking in, in prayer is a way of life. It's kind of a different way of looking at it. For indigenous people, it's just a way of life. This is what we do. And to continue to share this message is to educate our relatives here that whenever you go to New York or you go to Nevada or you go to Oklahoma, Wyoming, anywhere you go is that it's indigenous land. And it's important that you acknowledge that because being desensitized and looking the other way is not easy. Um, one of the things that I've seen from checking in thousands of people is there's anger that comes up. Confusion comes up. That this history is still here. History is repeating itself. There's a um, little bit of that um, guilt that comes up. And what do you do with that? And now for the first two months, you guys, uh, I don't know if you guys at the camp, there was thousands of people coming in waves and in media and journalists and filmmakers and audio guys and photographers. Who controls the media controls the culture. And for too long, our indigenous culture and media through media has been controlled. That's why everyone thought we lived in teepees. But at Stanley Rock, we did, <laughs> but on our own terms. And, and, it's, and it's okay to ask questions. You know, if you guys want to ask questions, it's okay because the only ignorant question is an unasked one. And I, I, asked, uh, I answered a lot of questions to share why we were here, what this meant, and to share the narrative that this was an indigenous movement here, this was an indigenous issue that was an inherent rights issue that we were seeing violated and that it was no longer going to happen. And by sharing that message, it's continually educating our non-native relatives that even here, when you are awakened, you can no longer turn away. And so like as we watched before the movie played, and you guys were, the, the videos we showed, I didn't see anything of the first people here on the videos. And it's up to you to correct that. Now that you know the conservation comes from the original people here, the answers come from them. How did they take care of the land? How did they make sure that land was okay? The voice should be there. And it's not easy. One of the things I learned from directors and filmmakers is that they really want their name on those credits. You know, so I, am, I want to empower you and challenge you to make that wrong right. And that That's part of the healing. And it's okay. There's only 2% of the population in the United States are indigenous people. We we're almost wiped off the face of the earth. Those 2% protect 70% of the natural resources throughout this country. How is that possible? So it's a real awakening when you, now that you know that number, will make that 80% of the natural resources throughout the world, indigenous people are protecting that same 2% worldwide. And that was powerful to hear from our South America, North America coming together and these prophecies being fulfilled and the black snake is that metaphor 
as a, of the pipeline, but it's not done. The pipeline, the snake's head has not been cut off. The pipeline is still going. That was only a few months ago. I mean, it's hard to believe it was a few months ago that we were in negative 40 degree weather sharing that space together and bringing it here to you guys. And so ask yourself those questions. What can I do? Well, what you can do is educate yourself, go to the indigenous people around these areas and ask them, what can I do to help? And I wanna thank the host for sharing that and thank you guys for asking that question. It's very important as you learn that um, we speak for ourselves because we're still here. We're not in the past. We're still here and we're still speaking and sharing that in a good way. Thank you so much. Um, James, I'd like to ask you if you could give a context for the people here and you know about how many pipelines there are. At one point in the film we see a map and so on the one hand there's you know the sense that all of this land including where we are now has been indigenous land but also that the battle for pipelines and uh, every battle that is being fought there is being fought everywhere and how that fits into kind of a big picture that we all kind of live with it going on wherever we are. Well, uh, thank you again for, for doing this. And um, this is just, uh, every time I see this film, it's kind of an emotional experience. Um, I don't know if I can give you an exact number, but it's in the thousands. Um, the fracking wells are in, I believe, over a million now. Uh, so, you know, Standing Rock was this amazing moment where all these people converged and fought this one pipeline. But of course, I mean, it's our way of life. And that's, that's I think, the hard thing for people to get their minds around uh, how pervasive this is, how widespread it is. Um, and, um, you know, for me being, you know, it's, it's like even the Standing Rock story is so huge that it can't be covered in one film. So just to be part of this, bringing the story of this one film out for me was really important, but, but you're right. It, it connects to this much larger issue of, you know, why are we still, um, relying on fossil fuels, um, for our energy uh, needs and and for the for our for our in, for infrastructure, um, and you know when you get into the answer to that, you get into things like well, who controls um, the legislation and who controls the money, and um, you know I ask people sometimes, you know, do you know when the internal combustion engine was invented? And most people think like 1850, 1860. Actually, it goes back to the 18th century. It's an 18th century invention. You know, we're, we're, we're driving around essentially something that was invented in 1792 and, and was being mass produced by 1830s. So it's over 200 years old. But we're still told this is the only way, it's the only possible way we can do it, you know. And, and we, by the way, we're putting in this infrastructure like pipelines, which are not just, as we were discussing this morning, it's not, it's not just for the next couple of years. These huge billion dollar projects are projected out for these industries for the next 50 years, 60 years. 75 years. It's nuts. I mean, they're telling us 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we needed that transformation. So, I mean, it's daunting. I don't want to, like, you know, be the, the downer of, of the... But we, we have to understand what we're facing because it is our whole way of life. And it's all connected to this process that Myron and, and other people are talking about of colonization, of exploitation of resources, of taking away resources from, from people, you know. Um, what goes on at Standing Rock in many ways is what goes on in Iraq. Now, the weapons are different, okay? Mm -hmm. But the essential process is the same, which is a domination, it's a colonization, it's pulling out resources, it's treating the earth as, you know, this source of money, essentially, and power. So, you know, how do we change that? You know, I don't think it's really going to change until there's some sort of spiritual awakening. And, 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 you know, you come back to the title of the film and you come back to what we were talking about earlier today, the importance of this of being an indigenous-led movement. Because the solution is not, what is some new thing that we need to come up to? 
come up with. You know, the solution is the ways that have been here all along. And it's, it's the larger society. It's our colonial society. We're all part of colonial society that has lost touch with the earth, lost touch with the fact that we are all connected. So that was a very long-winded answer to you, your somewhat <laughs> simple question. But <laughs> it was a pretty systemic question. I thought you, I thought you did pretty so, good. Right I'll try to be sure. No, I, I thought that was really that's a, that was a, that was kind of a tough question because that's like the systemic piece that affects all of us, um, and and so what we're talking about and what the film is showing is a kind of new level of heart and commitment and courage and also humility in being led by values that maybe are traditional in your culture but not so much in the greater culture and how we find our way to a return of that, as well as, you know, in some ways there are practical solutions. And Tanyette Colon is here with us on the panel because um, she laid down tracks to actually do some practical things that can be done, namely, and, and it's mentioned in the film, withdrawing investment, divestment from the banks and entities that fund these pipelines. So that you know we're they're proceeding even as we are upset at this being what our society is doing in our name but meanwhile they proceed because the money is going there and Tanyette spent seven or eight years what I call laying down she's a filmmaker uh, and a, a PR person extraordinaire um, laying down and, and also a northeastern uh, region for activists uh, which is how we connected um, but laying down tracks in Norway, which is actually heavily invested, and they're not the only banks or uh, institutions that are invested. There are many in our own country that still remain to be uh, divested. But, but Tanyet um, laid down the tracks in Norway for a conversation with very prominent banks to proceed about divesting funds from the Dakota Access Pipeline and um, several Standing Rock water protectresses were able to fa walk on these tracks to go to Norway and uh, tell their story uh, to the Norwegian banking community. And so I just, it's kind of a hopeful thing, uh, a modeling of a hopeful thing that on a practical level we could participate in. And so if you could talk a little bit about that. Definitely. So obviously the documentary talks about the individual, what you can do with your individual finances, but this conversation of where we're going as you know, the global community, it, the conversation has to become more global. Whenever I talk about Norway, I have family there. People ask me, why Norway? How does, the, how does this small little non-assuming, very, for most people like Utopia, play a part in this global climate change conversation? They have three casts of characters that people need to understand because they have an oil fund which surpassed the Saudi oil fund about five or six years ago. That, to put it in context, their oil fund is about $900 billion. And basically what that means is they own a piece of every major big corporation across the globe. They also have an oil company called Stat Oil. And the people own 60% of that company and that oil company feeds into the government fund. Stat Oil has been producing here in the US. They're in North Dakota, north in the Bakken. So they're north of Dapple. And they've been in Pennsylvania. They've been in uh, Texas. And yet, can I can I ask you when you know? Because I think that gives a kind of general background of yeah. why Norway would be a, you know a, a good place to go and and have this persuasive conversation. And I think it goes to the awareness of what is implicated and what is happening and what is going on when we all participate in a certain aspect of business as usual. And so what was it like for the people there when the water protectresses came and shared what went on for them at Standing Rock and what's going on in the same way that this film does, it shares it with us. You know, we've just had our eyes further opened about what's going on and what, you know, what happened to these banks that are so financially vested when they heard the truth of what was being done. So we had the opportunity to speak to DMV Bank, which is the equivalency of Chase Bank here in the U.S. It's, it's Norway's largest uh, state-owned uh, bank. 
and um, we were able to speak to the actual oil fund committee, which is the other entity, and members of their government, members of parliament, and we had some public events. I can tell you that there was not a dry eye in some of these meetings. Um, I felt much gratitude to have been part of the bridge to get these women there, uh, very strong indigenous women that held, held the room and really had the opportunity to speak to the people who invested so they could no longer deny what had happened in North Dakota. They could no longer turn the blind eye because these women had all experienced it. They had all been uh, arrested and they were speaking directly to the people who made that. So there was a consequence to their investment. And that's always been my big thing with Norway is if you're going to invest, then we will have to have you bear witness. And if you're not gonna come here, come to the US to see what you're investing in, then we will bring it to you. So I, I think some of, DMB Bank especially, they were embarrassed because some of the people in that room that had made that decision initially thought that they had ticked off every single bo a box to make a what, what, what I would call quote unquote responsible investment. Um, and some of them were parents, so they, I mean, they felt really, really bad about that decision. And right as before we had the meeting with them, they had called me to state that they pulled out the loan um, in Dapple. So they had three parts to their investment with energy transfer partners. They had the stock, which they unloaded in November. They had the loan, the big loan, and then they had uh, with the credit line. And while we were there, they pulled, they finally pulled the loan. And my sources there told me that it was having the women's presence was the final straw to get them to move. And why this is so important is because this creates a domino effect in stopping this kind of process. Because they before that, they were actually gonna use the investment and energy transfer partners as the model to invest in infrastructure all over the world. And energy transfer partners is, you know, the the owner of the, the Dakota Access Pipeline, for those who may not recognize that name. So what we're talking about here, and we'll take it back uh, again, is, you know, what can we do? And so here it is, being aware of what's going on um, and being good allies by bringing to people who have a say what the consequences are of these choices and what we're doing and and you know they're there it's not always easy to draw this to people's attention or even to look at it ourselves um but you know this what this film does and what your advocacy work does and all of that is something that maybe we can all learn to do more um which is you know to be awake ourselves and to and to have those courageous actions i mean maybe we are not standing um, with the tremendous courage of the young people in the film, but maybe there's a way that we can stand in that courage. Could you? Yeah, so I want to say on a good note too, um, a few days ago, I, well, I just flew in from Bismarck, North Dakota, and prolific charges were all dropped. Woo! But the reason why they were dropped is because we had all the media. Who controls the media controls the culture, right? Well, the officer had his media too, and the charge was the three felonies were equaling seven years, and through his media, it showed Prolific going towards the plane. Well, Prolific was filming, if you've seen it, he had native, he had indigenized the media to do in uh, native style CSI and judge the miles between the plane and the drone in 4K video in all 360 direction to show that the officer was lying about every single charge. And what this does is set a precedence for all the water protectors, but it shows that Morton County had abused FAA regulations in getting no-fly zones over the pipeline. So we need you guys and there's so much you don't even know that you can do. It's somebody you may know, but this is an intellectual battle on top of it. And for us, throughout history, it's, it's a, this was a repeat of history happening. So when I went there, I, it's like a map laid out already. We knew what was happening since first contact, since this place was hit, since the next place was hit. This is a model that gets all the way down. 
the difference is, is our allies are on board as well and understand how to, how to bring those sources in and help us with those resources so we can continue this protection. Not the, not the type of like fight, but protecting. And if you're not a water protector, we tell the officers, do you drink water? <laughs> well, yes, you drink water. And would you drink dirty water? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't hand it to your children or newborn baby. Also, there at the media had documented the mercenaries that were there, which is Tiger Swan. They just came in an article out a few days ago that was also along the pipeline. And I would seen them almost every day out there. And the National Guard was out there in full force in the beginning to the end as well, and Homeland Security and Border Patrol. And even uh, the Yogi Bear feds were out there, which is a park ranger, federal officers, and just so many different, nine different federal agencies were there undercover. And it was unreal to see that they had actually occupied Custer's old campgrounds. So these are the things that they were trying to do, but at the very end, and bringing in Avengers, which are Humvees with missile launchers on them for our drones. So, you know, to try to use war tactic intimidation, as you've seen when they chased the guy in full force, the vets said this is what they did in Iraq because they were part of that. And they were on the right side of history. And when the vets came in uh, almost around 5,000, they were there to stand in front of the bullets so the indigenous people can pray. And right before the vet showed up, 550 churches and clergy from around the country and the world came to denounce the doctrine of discovery. And to denounce the doctrine of discovery and apologize for the sexual abuse, the rape, the, the loss of language, the force of language, the taking of the land in the name of God. And to say we are here to witness the indigenous people pray, not witness to the indigenous people we seen what was wrong. And I says, wow, I was standing there talking to one of the clergy in the front, and I said, well, wouldn't it be powerful if you went into the front and prayed with us? And he goes, well, we're not here for the, the political part. I says, well, you're, you're, we're in a demonstration of prayer. So I saw him the next day, and uh, he came up, and he goes, Myron, and he pulled up his arm, and he had the lawyer's <laughs> number on his arm. He goes, I'm gonna go pray. And I was like, all right, he listened. Well, later on that day, uh, they went to go pray up by the governor in the uh, Capitol. He wasn't there. So they went to the governor's house and they went to jail for praying. And the ironic part, they were sharing the story with us is the only native guy that was with them was the one that was picked out. And so they protected him and they were arrested. But if you were media, you were arrested. I was arrested. I was arrested for stalking Dakota Access mercenaries. And I actually told the officer that I'm documenting stalkers. And then I'd turn around and get the charge. But these are the charges that happened to 814 water protectors, 50 plus felonies, which is, they're profiting off of the legal system right now. And all of the volunteer lawyers are pro bono. So the donations that come in are to help water protectors get there and go to court. So that legal process, the systematic racism in the legal process is the hardest part that we're doing, dealing with right now is an intellectual battle. Would, uh, would there be a way for people to donate to the law yes. um, project? How, where would they find that if they wanted to help support that? Yes, uh, Water Legal uh, Protective is on Digital Smoke Channel. I posted it. It's the most common place you can go to get the information that we go firsthand and talk to. And they need a lot of help. Digital smoke screens. On Digital smoke Facebook. signals. Smoke signals. Yes. <laughs> on Facebook. You got them screens Fake too. Fake news. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, on the internet, on Facebook, you can check in and, and both follow um, Myron's ongoing video footage as he continues to film and live stream, as well as find ways to donate to the law team that's protecting the protectors. Yes, and this is a position, I would say, is that as independent media, we finally have a community journalist position funded by you guys, the community. So you actually get to see where your work goes, where your donations go, but there's water protectors that are taking what they learn at Standing Rock and going around to water camps and sharing their story, sharing the solutions, and bringing hope 
that their word and then holy space is not going unseen. Uh, does anyone from the audience have questions you would like to ask? Anyone have a question? Anna? It's not a question perhaps so much as a comment, and that is we've got the protesting part, and I am extremely grateful for all that you did out there and the opinion you do. Anna's saying we have the protesting part in the film, and she's grateful for that. And then we have the divesting part, which is also incredibly important. But to, I think the most important thing is to, something that, to remind us all that every time we buy a gallon of gasoline or gas, we are voting in favor of the pipeline, and in favor of, of the deep sea drilling, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's something that, if we can remember that each time we buy a gallon, in, in other words, we make individual divestment is also important, and we make individual choices as to our energy use and our options that also contribute um, to. Please. Just very briefly, you know, I, I, I once, um, I mean, we should all be conscious of, of our individual choices. It's absolutely important. Uh, however, when we're talking about massive society wide, you know, infrastructure, I heard someone compare it to it once, like when the Nazis rose up, you know, someone calling for, well, let's just not buy any German products. You know, that's what's, what's called for is massive response from the top on a, an organized, bureaucratic way. I mean, that, that's what's needed. I mean, it, it, so it's important for us to have that kind of awareness, but it's also important for us to, to push for, uh, well, in a democracy, supposedly our representatives are supposed to do this. And the question is, you know, do we have a democracy? And the, the reason protests and direct action are so important is to, you know, when the, when the democratic levers sort of don't function, we, we've got to push in other ways. Um, you know, so in many ways, these direct actions become even more important um, in raising awareness and in exposing what the state is doing. Um, you know, so there are, there are a lot of, I mean, not to, I mean, your point was re really well taken, but I think we also need to be aware that, you know, it won't happen with just with like, uh, I go get, you know, a car that uses less gas. I mean, we need, there, there's something very fundamental that has to happen in a shift, in, in, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, and, um, you know, so hopefully, you know, movements like this are going to push us in the right direction. Um, you, you know, I'm, I, one of my favorite quotes, and, and if you're, you know, someone who does protests and stuff, you're familiar with that Margaret Mead quote about, you know, a small group of committed people being the only thing that's ever changed right. the world. And, you know, it, it seems like the odds are insurmountable, but a lot of times, you know, it's just when the foe seems like invincible and at its peak, that's when the dominoes topple. So, um, you know, let's not lose hope either, but I think, we, you know, we need to keep pushing for, for our representatives and for, for a change, you know, from the top as well um, to, to do things differently add something on there is what you guys just witnessed was an international energy company having imminent domain over broken treaty land. So what does that mean to you guys? Well, what it means is, is how do we stop it? One way is to honor your forefathers' promises to the indigenous people. That is what it means. That would have never happened if that would have been kept. Honor your forefathers' promises to the indigenous people. And if you want to give back, you can always give back the land. <laughs> He's recommending that people read uh, an indigenous people's history of the United States as a way of getting more of that background. And I'd also love to hear you talk more about the doctrine of discovery because maybe people are not aware of what is meant by that. Well, I think one of the, you're in one of the first areas that where you can actually go to the indigenous people here and get that first-hand knowledge, which is very important. And so we have tribal members, can you raise your hand? So when we leave, get to go up there, uh, go up there or way down here, um, get to know <laughs> who they are, they can share with you the history and and first contact, I mean, that's that's something, as we've seen the wave come from first contact to last contact, all the way across into the gold, the gold rush, 
but killing in the name of God in the land is part of that doctrine of discovery. And then the way that it was done in the loss of language, the loss of uh, dignity, the, the atrocities that continue to happen, but also you witness the strength right here that we stood up together in, in prayer and forgave. And it's important that you forgive yourself for what happened too. Many people I want, that I spoke with asked for forgiveness. And I said, it's important that you forgive yourself. Then you can truly understand what that means. And I always tell them, but if you're really sorry and want to get back, get back to land. You know? <laughs> and I'm serious. How do you do that? You know, uh, we've, got, we've got one of the uh, most disabled places on the planet was at Sacred Stones, Oshek to Shiko and Rosebud, the largest yurt village in the world, off-grid, community, built out of love, gathering together, negative 40, cutting wood together. That's what we witnessed was a community of indigenous people. And you're all indigenous, especially if you've been, your family is from here, you're indigenous from Europe, right? And then how many have been back to their homelands to say, why did we leave? So this is important, this is very important, and it may not always be easy to go back, and you may not even know. You may just, your family may have said, this history was the atrocities, and we're gonna stop it with our grandchildren, we're not gonna tell them what happened. And we don't want them to carry that burden and weight, because it is not an American dream for us, it's an American Holocaust. And that's what we still see in that Stanley Rock, it's a continuation of that. So, oh, educate yourself, be conscious of who you're asking and how you're asking because of a conversation we had earlier is genocide is, is, a, is a term that gets thrown around when we're just talking. But to best educate yourself is that it's an indigenous historian you need, not an ethno historian that is a second sided source, not the original sided source for any of your professors in academia in here. Thank you. Do we have another question there? Yes, I was just uh, curious as to whether or not criminal charges have been brought against the governor of North Dakota, given he, uh, given his actions. Asking about criminal charges against the governor. And we need your help to do that. That's one big thing that we need to do is hold them accountable, but we need to hold ourselves accountable to hold them accountable as well. And how do they get that to that point in broken treaty land? And also not just that, but the farmers that got their land they got intimidated along from the mercenaries. And it wasn't for a lot of them, I wouldn't know what I know when I went out there. They're, protect yourself. Here's what's happening over there. In the small towns that are around there, that were scared, that had no support like the tribes do. See, we're one big tribe. When, when our indigenous people call out for help, we all came in and our allies came in. But I was thinking about them farmers who didn't have that and they sold their land. And some of them tried to hold off and got intimidated and said, this is imminent domain, it's not yours anyway. We're gonna take it. Either you take this or we're gonna take it. Well, the governor ordered the assault on yes. the peaceful protesters. So well, th he this, should be the one taking the jail. This was a, a demonstration of prayer. You gotta remember, if we were here, or New York or anywhere else, it would be a protest, right? But we're on indigenous land, actually broken treaty land and a demonstration of prayer is what it was. It was not protesting, it was water protecting. Mm -hmm. Changes the legal narrative that most people don't understand because when you go to protest, you give them the right to count it as, in Dakota Access would say, we're our losses from shutting down work today, we're gonna go get our insurance. Or the police officers getting their federal funding. You know, and I keep saying this is an intellectual battle. We already know, we know everything about white people and they still know nothing about us. <laughs> Yes. So one, one of the things many of you guys may not know, you all know what grave sites are. So for, for many tribes, they have cultural monitors that monitor these. Many of you guys don't even know you're on sacred sites all over this island. Educating yourselves, going to the tribe and saying, okay, well, we didn't know this. Now that we know this, what can we do? You bring in somebody to do cultural educating on the, in this, the site, the land, the sacred site, the traditional areas. For the Morton County Police Department, and you see in one of the videos, he was laughing. This was a, a really sick act that I've seen 
officers enjoying themselves and what they were doing. Then there's the other part where I seen officers crying. The difference is, is those officers crying weren't from Morton County. They were from other agencies that got brought in and they did not know why they were there. They thought they were coming to play with a bunch of toys, new toys, new equipment, new training, overtime. Mm -hmm. And so it's educating them. And I asked the guy that was given the training on the nonviolent training there for the officers. I asked him, do you have a cultural advisor for the officers because you're on Indian land? He says, no. He goes, but, but why would we? I says, you're on Indian land. You're dealing with a culture that these officers do not understand that they're going to take and excuse as an ag aggressive act in their eyes. They're going to use it as an excuse to use aggressive acts because they didn't take the time to educate themselves on the land they're on, the indigenous people's land, and why we're praying for sacred sites, the water, and the natural resources. And he goes, well, that's a good idea. I said, it's a great idea, a good idea. <laughs> and, and I want to talk to this guy. I had just happened to run into this guy at Best Buy. Morton County was not where we were as native people there. The time, the, the shift of, has changed. We had the technology, they did it. We had the expertise, they did it. We had the education. They weren't following the protocols and we were documenting all the violations happening every single day that they were making these mistakes. Even when you tell them, they felt they were above the law. So sharing that connection here in this county is to go to the, the, the tribal um, elders or the, the, if they have a cultural department, as they're up here, they can tell you more about their history than I can. But I want to encourage you to go to them and ask them, and they will know that. But throughout the country, it needs to be done, and we need your help to hold them accountable and say it is time to honor the forefathers' promises, from Lewis and Clark going across, making promises to indigenous people, and not holding account, not holding them accountable. This is where we are today. So to your first question, I believe the tribe has taken the action. Mm -hmm. And to your second one, there's a lot in there we didn't get to show, which is the man camps, yes. which women get stolen, a lot of crime, mm -hmm. alcohol, drugs, a lot of bad things happen. And we looked for those camps. Mm -hmm. And we actually found one after they had already moved it. And I spent a lot of, I mean, the way I was looking, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, wow, I look like 10 years older. I was so walking in the walking in a daze trying to make sure that we covered all angles that we were seeing. There was so much happening there. The Dakota Access Security were mercenaries. And as if you're life feeding, that's how I will get to them, is to reconnect their, their spirit by singing those songs. And I knew the FBI, all of the agencies were watching, the BIA, Bermudian Affairs were watching my life feed. So I would pray to them in a good way and role model those teachings because you had to. I knew they were watching. I finally had the audience that we needed to be paying attention to why we were there in protecting these places and helping our allies and helping our relatives protect these places. And we're going to continue to do that. And this was a, was a spiritual warfare. They couldn't break our spirit. And so as you can see, hands were up. They were shooting at the kneecaps. They were shooting... In the groin, they were hitting women. They thought they were men. In the groin, they were shooting the back of their hands when their hands were up in the head. They were doing destructive damage, and people were getting extremely hurt. We, You can hold them accountable. If you know somebody, you can say, you know what, we're going to direct attention this way. We're going to continue to do this and share with you guys how to do it, and that we can do it together and move forward. So it doesn't happen where a standing rock is coming near you. And I know you guys keep a lot of those resources out of this Martha's Vineyard. But you know, where do they go to get away from her? Here. So, you know, yeah, you're role modeling, but you're also protecting the place where they're coming here and buying big old homes and hiding out. I couldn't believe it when I seen it, when I was flying over it. And I always pay attention because when we've lost our traditional food source, our harvesting areas, when we see that there's mining there's big, there's big corporations, there's special interests now living there with big homes and mansions and green grass going all over the course with the golf course and many workers there. We know all too well because when that landscape changes, we know. And if you ever want to know if the environments change, ask the indigenous people, do you harvest your areas no more? Can you harvest your areas no more? Because we were nomadic. And I'm sure the tribe was like ours here, they wouldn't stay in one spot and over exhaust the resources. 
And as we confine ourselves into colonialism, that's what happens. We can no longer be nomadic and protect our lands and rejuvenate our lands. So are you suggesting that we... Give the land back? <laughs> <laughs> that is not my first question. Um, with the, the fact that the one percent, dare I call some of the people who come here, the one percent, they are here on the vineyard it, having their summer or what have you. Are you, pardon me? Oh, the walk on my Exactly. Um, are you suggesting that we participate? in a form of prayer uh, to help change them? I would say, you know, that is important. You could start by awakening their spirit. Mm -hmm. And how many ways are there to get here? So I didn't see anything about the tribe when I got on the plane. Mm -hmm. So reach out to the indigenous people here and say, we need something to awake them to come to this, come here. We also could put something on the ferry, you know, to honor the people that are here. Honor yourselves. That's very important. How do you honor yourself? Honor the indigenous people here. Because there were promises made that got ignored. Resources that were stolen, that were a way of life for us, that weren't resources. So you can do this. There is time. And today is the time. Everything we do today is very important because tomorrow is another day. So I just want to encourage you to get amongst each other and say, okay, we're not going to go and save them because we miss you miss it the last 500 years. So, but today we can start in creating solutions for tomorrow together and making sure that we don't we don't have to go through that all over again because there's going to be a standing rock coming near you and you're going to know there's going to be indigenous people there standing up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for